We're going to go on to a question now from Jeff, who is wondering about pensions, WFA, and bonuses on top. Jeff is from Manitoba. Hi. Uh, I represent over 400 members of the Customs and Immigration Union in Manitoba. My question is this. If a person is at the age where they have a fully uh, indexed pension ready, 52 weeks of severance pay sitting in the bank, under WFA there is another six months of pay on top of that to bring it up to 88 weeks. There is also a bonus that is being proposed, but the, the employer is not letting out that bonus because he's trying to, the, the employer is trying to get people to retire without that extra bonus. What is that extra bonus and how can we try and get our members everything we can when they're affected uh, for their own future? I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. Uh, certainly what you're suggesting doesn't sound like um, the obligations that are in uh, parts uh, one to six of the workforce adjustment in the collective agreement. Um, we could be using different language, uh, so so uh, you know I don't know, but I, it, what you're saying doesn't seem familiar to me. Now, under certain circumstances, if it were an alternate alternate delivery uh, initiative in part seven, then um, maybe uh, some of the things that you're saying, if we talked a bit uh, a bit about it, might make uh, more sense depending to me depending on the uh, the situation. However, the uh, workforce adjustment that um, that uh, CBSA and CIU members are, are, are going through uh, right now uh, is under parts one and six. Uh, so you would have whatever um, separation uh, pay that you haven't cashed out, uh, and you would have the uh, transition uh, allowance, which is based on um, your years of service and is in uh, Annex uh, B of the Workforce Adjustment uh, appendix attached to your collective agreement and uh, if you're between uh, if you're over 55 or between 59 you would be entitled to uh, the uh, pension waiver if you uh, chose to uh, take the trans transition support measure. Thanks for your question Jeff. If you have any follow-up questions or if anyone else on the call has any follow-up questions tonight you'll have an opportunity to leave a voice message at the end of this call and we encourage you to do so. We're going to go on to a question now from Don in Edmonton. Don has a question about shared services and future job opportunities. Don, what's your question tonight? Hi, uh, I belong to shared services and most of my duties are accounts payable. Uh, the 1st of April, shared services moved 90%, 95% of our accounts to their centralized office, leaving us with very little to do. And we've been told through a chain of command, uh, nobody in our department will lose their job and there will be no workforce adjustment. But, uh, you know, we're sitting with nothing to do, so would not uh, workforce adjustment be in place there? Uh, workforce adjustment's not in place unless the uh, deputy head uh, declares uh, that a workforce adjustment uh, situation occurs. I'm not completely sure what you mean about shared services um, because it's being used in uh, two different ways now. Um, uh, in a generic way, um, a lot of departments are moving to a shared services approach uh, to uh, some uh, different um, services that our members um, that are that our mem members provide. Um, uh, for instance, the, the pay and benefits move to Mayor Machi could be classified as a generic shared services uh, uh, um, initiative. Uh, also, though, they, the, uh, the employer created the new shared services department um, last summer, and uh, a number of our members and members from other bargaining units are moving to the new shared services uh, department and um, will actually be employed by that department, although not all of those uh, members will actually move, um, and many of them won't, in fact, uh, move uh, the locations, although that hasn't been determined as far as I know yet. Um, so, um, having said that, um, 
the, the fact that you may not have a lot of work to do doesn't mean that you're in a workforce adjustment situation. You you will, won't know if you're in a workforce adjustment situation until the uh, the uh, department declares that uh, that's in fact the case. And that's when they give the the union notice, and um, when um, a few days after that they will uh, meet with employees and um, you know give out effective notices or not. Thanks, Don. We're going to go to a question now to from Nicole in Calgary, who wants to know about uh, pension waiver. Nicole, what's your question tonight? Yes, hi. Um, I forgot to mention I'm with the Public Health Agency of Canada on the Treasury Board. Um, we're a satellite office in Calgary, and the whole office will be closed by March 31st, 2014. But uh, Public Health Agency is a little behind uh, getting our letters to us to mention if we're surplus or part of their merit assessment that will be held for the remaining positions in Edmonton. Uh, um, Edmonton, are, we're basically going down from eight CR4s to one, and it'll be located in Edmonton. And there's six employees in Edmonton and, one, and two in Calgary. I just wanted to give a little bit of background, sorry. Um, I'm 53. Um, we were told we would get uh, our letters by the end of May or end of June. And then we have 120 days, as I understand, to make a decision because um, I don't plan to relocate. So I'll be part of the surplus. Am I correct? I'll be uh, basically volunteering to retire. You've been declared an opting employee, yes. So my question is, then I have 120 days from end of May, if I get my letter then, is... September, end of September, and I'll have my 35 years service, but I'm still just 53. So I guess the pension waiver doesn't apply to me because I don't have the age, but I have the years. Because it's not my choice. It's the, gov it's the government telling me well, I don't have a job. I only have the choice of one job to compete with, with uh, seven others. So why should I be my pension be penalized because I'm 53? Um, if you are declared an opting employee, uh, one option that you have is the education allowance. Uh, with the transition support measure. And the education allowance uh, allows you to take leave without pay for two years. Um, and then you're still a public service employee and you can still contribute. Uh, you can still uh, be part of the superannuation and benefits. Um, and so that then may bridge you to the uh, age 55 um, where you would be eligible for the waiver. Uh, oh, no, no, sorry. The waiver is not applicable to the education allowance. So, sorry about that. Um, but there may be other um, options in terms of additional time. For example, there also is a retention payment that's possible for uh, when the relocation uh, is, uh, when there's a relocation. Um, employees who stay until the office closes can be given a retention payment. And if you've reached 55, you can uh, be subject uh, to the waiver. But if, um, if not, uh, the legislation is the thing that specifies that you have to be 55 uh, to, um, to uh, be eligible for the waiver. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. Now we're going to go on to Sue, who wants to know about education allowance and restrictions. Sue, what's your question tonight? Hi, yes. Um, I'm in Edmonton with Natural Resources, and I'm an affected employee. And I should be getting my letter on April 30th telling me whether or not I'm guaranteed a reasonable job offer, but I'm expecting I won't get one. So the education allowance, um, what is, other than the school having to be a registered school, what are the restrictions as to what courses I can take? Do they have to be related to going back to government work, or can I take anything I want? And could it be more than one course that may not be related as long as I don't go past the $10,000 um, allowed, and could it be full-time or part-time? <laughs> we don't get a lot of information on that. Yeah, I believe the answer to uh, all of those questions is um, yes. Uh, all that says is that uh, you need to provide the receipt and uh, you have to be registered in a um, affected uh, learning institution. I'm trying to find the exact language here, right. I, and I'm sort of floating around it, but I haven't quite found it here. 
the uh, yeah the education allowance is uh, p paid for reimbursement of receipted expenses for tuition uh, from a learning institution and cost of books and mandatory uh, equipment. The um, the collective agreement doesn't limit it to specific learning institutions or types of study. It just says that uh, you have to provide your organization with proof of registration from a learning institution. And so you do, you can study, um, you know, there's no limit on what you can study as long as it's a, a recognized institution such as a college, university, or a, a other kind of uh, educational institution. Um, and then you will just get reimbursement up to $10,000 uh, for your costs. So um, there isn't any uh, other uh, restrictions on it. Um, and, uh, and so uh, really it's up to you uh, what to study. Um, you know, when you, uh, when you, if you take that option. Thanks, Sue. Okay, then we're going to go to Carol with a question about classification and pay levels. Carol, what's your question tonight? My question is, uh, CRA has different classification from the rest of the public service. How does that work with somebody that would be uh, WFA and say CRA had jobs for them? Well, with, with alternation, it's our understanding, with the exception perhaps of CFIA, that uh, there, there would not be alternation uh, between um, the core public service and uh, CRA. There could be alternation within a CRA. Um, so in that particular instance, it, uh, it uh, may not uh, be an issue. Ordinarily, though, I mean, uh, if the uh, agency or if the core public service extended uh, a, a, re a job offer to you uh, in, in one or the other, um, then it, it could be uh, considered a reasonable job offer if it uh, met the, um, the, the criteria of, um, of, uh, of seamless uh, benefits. Uh, um, that I think would be somewhat unlikely uh, with CRA. The what was negotiated by the union in the uh, 90s was that a match uh, could be um, any uh, job uh, within six uh, percent. So if you were moving from a job, um, uh, say in um, HRSD, to uh, one in um, in um, public works, and the uh, cla and the classification uh, was different, uh, but it was but the pay uh, grade was within six percent of one another. Then um, that alternation would uh, still be allowed. Uh, as I say, it's a little bit more complicated uh, with the with the agencies. Um, and particularly with uh, CRA, where they've been very, very um, uh, mindful and uh, sort of uh, jealous of any uh, incursion on uh, their independent staffing system. Thanks again for your question. 